On today's episode of PJ and the Beard, we're bringing you another installment from our interview series. And the Beard is going to tell you not only who you're, we're interviewing, but why are we interviewing this mysterious guest at this moment. Right. Let's start with the why. Um, if you've watched the show for any length of time, you might remember some of the field trips we did. And we went over to one of my friend's houses, uh, Ray, Ray's house. And Ray had a guitar that I had my eyes on for, I, I really think, in Pat, it's going like 20 years. And, with you know, what was it? Maybe a year later, he sends me a text message out of the blue. And he knows I like that guitar. Sends me a text message out of the blue and says, hey, I'm ready to kind of thin the herd a little bit. I know you like this guitar. Do you want to work something out? And we work something out. And the guitar is now mine which I'm very excited about. And you've, if you've been watching the uh, Shakedown Sound series where we've been doing all the envelope filters, you've seen the guitar on every episode. And we wanted to learn a little bit more about the guitar. So the best way we figured to learn about this guitar was to bring on the builder, the creator of this guitar. So we're going to welcome to the stream right now, uh, Mr. Michael Dolan. So I'll start off just by saying, Michael, thank you so much for you know giving some you know, spending some of your time with us this evening. We really appreciate that. And uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, checked my ancient notes and uh, <laughs> and come up with a, uh, a an interesting uh, fact or two about that guitar that we're talking about. So um, refreshing my own memory, um, looking forward to surprising you a little bit. Great. And so, so you still have notes on it. I do. I, I managed to find them today. That's awesome. That's great. Well, let's, let's get into this a little bit. I think, you know, Pat and I talked a little bit, probably the place that we'd like to start, even before we get into the guitar is just, you know, tell us a little bit about Michael Dolan, about your history. Like, how did you get into building guitars? Uh, we know, I know some of the backstory about that. And I think when people look at the guitar, they're going to, maybe be able to think about some of the backstory with that, but I think it would be good coming from you. Okay. Um, this story for me always starts at a party at Prairie Sun Recording Studio. And, um, and even before that, a, a friend of mine, uh, Barney Salzberg, had a box of guitar parts that was behind his couch and he was he told me that one day he was thinking he would do something with those guitar parts so it, it really intrigued me and this was probably 1975 early and um i said well let me take those home and see uh see what i could do i i, I that that seems like a real interesting thing to do and i had recently graduated from college with a a major in art. So um, I was thinking, you know, some kind of art project out of these guitar parts. And um, I went to a, a party across the street from my house at a recording studio. Some friends of mine were redoing some recordings and I met a man named Paul Schaefer at the party. I happened to mention to somebody that I was had a box of guitar parts and I was interested in doing something with them and and uh, and somebody directed me to Paul and said he works for a guitar builder. You should go talk to him. So um, that is is the very beginning of how I got started in guitar building because Paul worked at Alembic and at Alembic at the time these were you know pretty close to hippie days. Alembic at the time was. Um, had a policy of anybody could come into their studios, any of the employees, and bring guests on a particular evening of the week and show them around. So that really fascinated me, seeing the tools and the, all the guitars in, pro, in progress at Alembic. And uh, it didn't take me long to put together a, uh, a portfolio of my work from school and go in there and apply for a job. Um, at the time, they said they didn't need anybody, but a couple of weeks later, they called me and they were looking for somebody to do production work. And um, so my introduction, that's my basic introduction um, 
to uh, how I got started in the business. And uh, it was sort of ser serendipitous. Um, and on the other hand, um, it also feels just like the path, you know, that kind of thing where you're doing what you're supposed to do, just being curious and you fall into what you're supposed to, you know, where you're supposed to go. Uh, absolutely. That's, well, yeah. if, you, if you follow your passion, you'll never work a day in your life kind of thing. Yeah, it's kind of been that way. So in, trying to think back to the conversation we had before, how many you were at a, Olympic, what, like two, three years, maybe? I was there almost exactly two years, yeah. Okay, and then that took you off to building your own guitars. Yeah, it was, um, well, <laughs> this is going to sound silly, but at the time it was, I think, four and a quarter an hour. And um, it's, uh, and I felt like, you know, somebody else was making the money. And, uh, and I was living the student hippie lifestyle still. So I figured I could do that on my own. So that's what happened. Awesome. So I was thinking about two things as you were talking. One, you know, you went to art school and then you find yourself building guitar out of parts, like kind of mm -hmm. like what, what gave you the confidence to do that. And then maybe the other part a little bit later, having been at Olympic for two years and left, what do you think one of the biggest things you learned at Alembic was? Oh, um, at Alembic at the time, um, they would take us and put us on a, on a workstation where we were needed. And then when that part was caught, caught up, they would move you somewhere else. So one week you'd be doing, you know, 40 or 50 fret jobs on, a, on guitars. And the next week, you would uh, you would be in the spray booth or drilling hardware or something, so it was a it was a crash course in custom guitar building. Mm -hmm. And was there one technique or one? I know you. It doesn't sound like you're a pigeonhole. Obviously, is there one big thing you learned there that maybe carried on to your own building and maybe even carries on to today? The uh, the style of building at Olympic. Uh, you know, the hippie sandwich construction, the rounded edges and the laminated cores. And, you know, that was where I got that introduction. And in the 70s, it was uh, very popular. And uh, I think that's partly what allowed me to get going was that I favored that style of building and I liked it. And um, so I built guitars for, you know, several years and still occasionally. Um, using that style of construction. So I think maybe the inspiration of just the design of some of their guitars is what got me rolling. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and maybe that's a good segue into the guitar, <laughs> the guitar for the evening, right? So, and I have it sitting here uh, just for, I mean, we can't really, the live stream is always hard to play, but so you're thinking... Well, you, you'll probably know, if you found your notes, maybe you'll know the date a little more precise now, but uh, just for anybody when they're watching this, this is what we're looking at. And I know it's, you know, I could do this. Just give me one second. We'll just make it nice and big real quick in front of the camera. <laughs> and then you got this beautiful inlay work. I love your logo inlay. Thanks. Uh I mean, it's worth showing the side too. The back, you can see in the camera a little bit of the flame in there. So, let me get out of the solo layout. Let's talk a little bit about what you learned from your notes and find out a little bit about I, you know, kind of specs and things. It doesn't have to be down to the radius or something, but materials and stuff like that. Well, as you can see, the, the body's top and back is um, is uh, spalted and figured uh, maple. Uh, kind of an interesting piece of wood. You don't usually find both in the same logs, but sometimes you do. Um, according to my notes, the core is, I, I'm going to have to put on glasses here, um, walnut and koa which uh, in the neck is Purple Heart, right? Purple Heart. And um, let's see. 
Koa and Purple Heart in the neck. So Koa has become a wood that I have always just loved. And, and um, so that particular instrument features those two woods. So when you said the court you're talking here, we have the walnut and the koa. Right. And then here we have the purple heart. And the koa. And the koa. And, and obviously, you know, uh, some laminations in there, probably maple veneer from the looks of it. Yeah. 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 So um, I guess the big surprise is that was number four. Mm-hmm. And I built it in 1977, late in 1977. Oh, wow. That's a very early Dolan guitar. Um, The other thing I discovered was, and this this gives me some of the background why I didn't remember the customer uh, well, is that it was sold through a music store in San Rafael called Bananas at Large. So I had taken it down there on consignment and uh, they had sold it. And um, then the lady that bought it got in touch with me and told me she had an art gallery and that's where it was going to go hang. <laughs> so this is the fourth, when you say number four, you mean the fourth guitar you ever made? The fourth guitar I made as a custom, as an independent custom builder. Yeah. 1977, mm-hmm. same year that I wow. left Olympic. That's crazy. That's really cool. So yeah, it, and it's it does, for, for your information, if it, if it's all uh, uh, has any import to you at all, the serial number is one zero zero four. So one of the things I love about doing something like this is, you know, I just wrote that down, which is kind of silly because we'll have this video now, you know, like yes. we're documenting the guitar. So if anybody ever wants to argue with us over what the serial number, well, if anybody wants to argue with my wife after I die and she sells it on what the serial number is, they can come back and hear it right from the, the horse's mouth. Um, that's awesome. That's really cool. Thanks. Good. So, so kind of a really interesting, awkward question. Do you have any idea what it would have sold for? Oh, back then? Yeah. Gosh. Um, I may have the notes on that, but I don't think I do because um, I kept a receipt pad in those days. And, um, and, as far as what I remember, I never saw a receipt from that period by bananas from bananas. So they probably had me handed me a check for the guitar and maybe I signed a receipt there for from them, but mm-hmm. I have no no recollection. But at the time, I think uh, my guitars were I don't know, not much in the thousand dollar probably range. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so, for a custom guitar with that much work, that's that's crazy. Yeah, though. yeah well, I mean, today's I dollars are, have no relevance to 1977. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you've used the word hippie several times in $4.25 an hour. So, <laughs> <you know. laughs> yeah. so what are some of the, like, so let's talk. Do, do you know what the neck, uh, is it rosewood or? The fingerboard? Yeah. I believe, yes. I believe my notes do mention that it is a rosewood fingerboard. Mm -hmm. Nothing specific about the rosewood. Just says rosewood fingerboard with MOP Baroque inlay. (laughs) Okay. Well, maybe that's a good good, uh, transition, too. Like, let's let's talk about the inlays a little bit. Um, And I think I told you when I talked to you before that – the inlays on this guitar just made it literally made me go to YouTube and look up to watch a video on how people do guitar inlays mm-hmm. because I mean, they're so detailed, you know, like, I mean, how does one pull that off? And it's not just the inlays on the, the neck. You have the headstock inlay, your logo, you have the inlay on the, the electronics cover in the back. Um, it, it looks like quite a bit of work. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> consider for one thing um, 
that I like to draw and I, I like to see my drawings come to, you know, fruition. So um, the, the doing of it is more or less, is, after it's designed, the doing of it is more or less to see it in reality. And, and, and it does require, you know, maybe obviously some patience um, to do that kind of work. But it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it, it, I guess um, what I'm trying to say is uh, it's not tedious or tiresome. It's just process. It's just, you know, if you were sitting at a, say, a, a computer terminal all day long, uh, well, I'd rather be cutting inlay and <laughs> it would be just as interesting to me. So, right. um, so um, yeah, it, it does take some time and it's not, um, uh, it, it's not for people that have a lot of impatience, I would say. What's the material that you would have used for that? Is it That's mother of pearl. It's, uh, it's basically clamshell, but we call it mother of pearl. Okay. Um, when you there are a couple things that jump out at me too. So one the the plate here. Mm -hmm. Um, is that something you made, designed, or is that both? Yeah, I would have made that out of brass and and uh, and then sent it to a polished up and sent it to a a plater. Yeah, and then. You know, brass saddles, brass nut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, is there any particular? Do you still do that? Yes, I do, and uh, it, and it's because of the, you know, a lot of my customers have, have aged with that ideal in mind, and there's a, there is a kind of a piano like. Um, resonance that you get out of the weight of the hardware so uh, in in the with particularly with bass players um there, there are still people that request that leftover from that same era you know leftover from the 70s um that was the ideal so you, i mean i feel like you don't see it as much anymore well you probably well, yeah. don't <laughs> yeah but i mean like <laughs> This being the only guitar that I, well, up until the point when I got this, was the only guitar I owned that has the, the brass saddles, brass uh, nut on it. And I do feel like there's a there's a tonal characteristic to that, I guess. Mm -hmm. there's, um, there's, there's some ring, some punchiness, some uh, strength on the attack that maybe isn't there with softer materials or a guitar that's not, you know, put together to make that sound. Right. There's some electronics questions, maybe Pat, I was wondering if you had a, anything that you were thinking about before I moved on. Well, I was thinking about it. Cause I mean, you mentioned being an artist and seeing things go to fruition and Jason mentioned it. I have never seen an electronics cover like that, right? For one that's Maybe not. It, there's a pretty interesting piece of grain that runs through that back, and you matched it up perfectly, and then you also put a design on the cover itself. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought that was a really uh, over-the-top, in a good way, attention to detail and really creative. Uh, is is that something you did on just a lot of custom orders, or that's, is that the artist in you? or? Well... Show me the back of the guitar again, and I'll explain something to you. Let's see. Can I? Yeah, I want to see the, the cover. The cover. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out where that <laughs> is in the camera. There you go. The way that's cut. Oh, boy, I'm not doing this well. That's there right. That's all right. It, it's fine. I think everybody's gotten the idea. The way that's cut is uh, by sticking a... Uh, Dremel in this particular case into a hole in the middle of the cover and then just running it around in circles until you've cut through. Well, that hole has to, you, know, <laughs> you have to cover it with something. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just a matter of, um, 
what to do oh. that fits. So that that's the hole you're talking about. There's a hole like, dead center, yeah. You know. And then you put the inlay over top of the hole. I right. See. Yeah. You can see that. Um, two things, you know, another thing that kind of jumped out of me that's different is the double toggle switch here, mm -hmm. which I really like, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. And then um, there's a four way tone knob there, too. I don't know if you wanted to why you went that direction and what that was about and um it, if you even can remember <laughs> yeah. it's not it, it, yeah there, there is that but um and i don't think there's anything in these notes that i have for this guitar um uh, and i could look through some drawings and maybe find more but there's nothing about the way i wired that up in here um i was probably just experimenting at the time you know uh, do you I know still that, use that double toggle switch? I do, but usually it's for the usual reasons. It's you know, it, rather than a pickup selector, it it's sometimes used for that, but uh, more often it's used for coil splits and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, yeah that would be. It, and it's it's weird because I I like it. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, you know, to be able to turn one on, turn. Yeah, I, I don't know. I. I, I the longer I've played it, the more I've, I've, I've liked it, you know, because, you know, being a traditional like three way toggle kind of guy, probably on a double humbucker guitar, am I going to like that? And it's, it is really easy to, uh, once you get used to it and know how to flip them, it's, it's pretty easy. Yeah. And there's the other upside to that system is that you can turn the guitar off at the toggle switches. Right. Because, who doesn't like to do that, right? <laughs> it's Some, a big word sometimes with... it's a good idea. Yeah. Or just to kind of flick it back and forth really fast. There you go. <laughs> <Still in tremolos. laughs> so awesome. Um, what are we are we missing anything guitar related? You can think of not that I can think of. Um we talked about the woods, and I just find it interesting, you know, again, a 40, well, more than 40-year-old guitar now, closer to 50. Uh, just thinking some of the woods you used then and what that would be now with the Koa and the Purple Heart is just a, a really well-done piece. And to think that that was just number four. Now you set up the custom and you start doing that. Whatever, but yeah. I, I had spent two years dealing with exotic woods at that mm -hmm. point, you know, on a daily basis. So, yeah, not exactly brand new to it, but uh, as far as my building, it was, there were people at Alembic who were actually producing guitars that uh, made the Olympics look a little simplistic, <laughs> if I can say that. Mm -hmm. You know, Doug Irwin, who built Jerry Garcia's guitars, um, gosh, Frank Fuller was there who designed some of the Olympic stuff. And a lot of these guys, you know, they knew that a three guitar sandwich was not the limit. You could put as much pieces in them as you, uh, as you wanted. And uh, so, you know, and that, that there were guitars around uh, Bruce Beckvar was another guy building there. Larry Robinson was uh, there doing, um, guitar work at the same time and we were all you know looking for ways to expand the vocabulary on our own mm -hmm. there there's one thing that you made me think of that we are missing and that is the fact and i didn't pick up on this until um when i when the, the guitar came to me the original pickups have been taken out so uh and it had a, a cheap pair of like kind of import pickups in it. So I had the guy that we work with, Chris from Woodshed, uh, for people that know him, went in and put the different set of pickups in it for me. And that's when I realized it's, it's you know, chambered. You know, so that's another thing that people might not realize about it. Both sides are chambered, right? Yes. Yeah. Chances are, again, that's the way uh, Alembic did them. And i uh, um, I may have just been being a copycat about it, but that's the way I built a lot of guitars. It's especially early in my 
um, building career. Well, that would copying is the uh, greatest form of flattery, isn't that what they say? <laughs> it also cuts down the weight <laughs> when you're using yeah. hard hardwoods, the exotic hardwoods like maple and purple heart. You got to pay attention to the weight to some degree. Well, when Ray, when Ray and I did this, one of the things he said to me is he's like, you know, that guitar, that neck is never going to move. And it, you know, I tune it Sunday play. Sometimes it sits in the case until the next week I pull it out and I swear it's still in tune. Like, it's like the neck doesn't move. Yeah. Is that the purple heart then? Um, I don't know about the dimensions on that particular neck, but, um, you know, once, once they're stable, um, there's a, there's a big difference between laminating wood with the grain, um, you know, perpendicular to the fingerboard, which is what that is and how I build and the flat cut slabs that Fender uses in their necks, the, the flexibility is, it's, it's completely on a different planet as far as like movement. You know, if you're lucky, you get a Stratocaster that stays straight. You'll never find a Fender bass <laughs> that, that they'll stay straight for its lifetime, I don't think. But, um, but when you build them with the, with the, the, the grain vertical up toward the fingerboard. It's it's a pretty stiff neck. It works. Yeah. I, I, I guess I have just two questions why we're still in 1977, right? Um, <laughs> one, did you make uh, bases as well at that point? And more more bases, actually. I've, I've always okay. been more of a base builder. Um, I would say... At this point in my career, because I've branched out into acoustics and ukuleles and things like that, um, the building is probably still close to 50% bases. Hmm. You had yeah, another that's, question? That's cool. Well, the other one was thinking about, you know, you're, you're branching out on your own. You know, where did you build a move? Were you in a garage or basement, a, a rented space, and, and then just all of the the tools and everything that would be required to build these and then just sanding and shaping all of those layers. Like it just seems it's quite an undertaking. So that that's it. I like that question. That's a good question because it brings me back to another part of the story and my roots. And, and uh, I guess we can uh, um, just use that if, if it's appropriate, but um, I was living in a, in a space uh, in Katadi when I was working uh, for Alembic. And um, there was an old barn basically in back of it. And, um, you know, once I got interested in building instruments, um, all the guys that were there that, um, that were luthiers in the neighborhood and also a few of the guys from uh, Alembic, um, I decided, well, we should do something with this shop space, this barn. And uh, what we did was I invited anybody who wanted to be part of it to, to, uh, to come and build there. And the price of admission was a power tool. So <laughs> I bought a table saw, somebody else brought a band saw, somebody else brought a drill press, and I've still got some of those tools from those days. But um, yeah, that was that was how we set it up. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's brilliant. Yeah, so, you were way ahead of the game, shared workspace on concepts. You should have started that. Then you could have been like WeWork or somebody at this point. <laughs> So, I, I mean, again, that I think brings us to where you're at now. Um, is there anything you want to share? Like, you, you know, you said you started doing acoustics and ukuleles and things like that. What's it look like now? Well, oddly enough, this, the situation is, is, is similar. I, I live on a piece of property with a 40 by 30 um, 
shop and it was that way when my wife and I bought it and um, and uh, yeah I'm I'm solo now I don't have any employees anymore and uh, so I just putter around here doing uh, remote control airplanes and guitars <laughs> So you're still building. Yeah. Um, are you building? Is it mostly like kind of custom orders that you're doing now, or um, it's it's uh, I build kind of compulsively on speculation, just because I'll get an idea in my head that it's something that I want to see happen, and so <laughs> I go st start in on it and you know work it into the rotation and work on it until it's finished. So I, I'm still doing stuff like that. Uh, my wife and I both play ukulele, and um, so you know there there's a the the ukulele version of of gas, you know the, <laughs> the acquisition syndrome. Right. Oh, we we know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I see the rat. You <laughs> haven't found a cure yet. No. Yeah. So uh, so I've been. You know, and, and, and occasionally people have me build ukuleles and acoustic guitars. And, um, if you got a minute, I'll grab a couple of things and, and show you some of the stuff. Oh, that'd be awesome. Right. Yeah, I'd love to see uh, it. I don't know how well this is going to work, and I'll shift the, the the screen around, but I'll go get a couple of things. Well, as long as it's better than Jason trying to show the control panel, you're way ahead of the game. <laughs> <laughs> Because everything's upside down and backwards, and so yeah, Jason. I don't know if you just want to show the inlay real quick why he's going to do that. Because you kind of showed it, but like that's that's just stunning, and to think that that's mother of pearl and that's hand done, and and it wasn't uh, laborious to the creator. I mean, that's it's really something. See how far away I have to get to where you can see this. Let me uh, unfold that. And I can make you big. Okay, well, that might not be your... Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is a little ukulele that I built for my wife. Um, oh, a few years ago now. And... Uh, That's beautiful. Yeah, it's a, it's a cutie. It's, it's a nice sounding instrument. Let's see. There's... The little inlay in the headstock. Her name's Mary. If you can read that, so um, that's a that's one of the the ukuleles. And then um, I've got this uh, sort of odd obsession with five strings. And uh, this is a ten string guitar that I built um, for myself. It's my own living room guitar. Hmm. So, um, is that Enley on the 12th fret again? Yeah, it's the you probably recognize that one from Hot Riding, the flying eyeball. Yeah, and I love the inlay work around the sound hole, too. Yeah, it's it, it was it was a fun one. It's it's very random, um, just pieces of uh, little pieces of wood fit in there. It's uh, got a matching heel cap back here oh that's very cool what's that i don't know if it's in tune what's it sound like if you strum it um oddly enough it sounds like it's close so um the range um it's it's interesting because all all five strings are octaves so um, the range is actually a little more than a 12-string guitar. The highest string is an A. I don't know if it's, if it's tuned that way right now. And the lowest string is a D. Wow. So it's got, it's got quite a bit of range. Um, and it's, it's just a gorgeous sounding instrument. I don't know how much of that comes through the microphone, but I, I really like the sound of that. Really cool. Yeah, it gets, there's like a compression that's always on these that kind of yeah probably sort of sound a little bit, but <laughs> you get an you get an idea. It's beautiful. Yeah. They're both beautiful. 
looking instrument. Kind of a cross between a can of nails and a guitar, as far as the sound. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. So you're, wow. I know that there is a a website out there still, right? The Michael Dolan Custom or DolanGuitars.com. Yeah, I think that's the way you access it is DolanGuitars.com. And I can actually just real quick, um, if I hit share, share screen. You gotta remember, we haven't done this in a We used to do, we were doing so many of these kind of things there for a while. So DolanGuitars.com. Um, and I mean, the big you thing. You by the picture there that that's at least 10 or 15 years old. Oh, of course, <laughs> why not? Um, I would say the big thing on the guitar, if people are interested, is the email, the email link if they wanted to reach out to you about something. But I mean, even just popping and looking at the uh, gallery real quick, uh, there's just a lot of examples there of some of the cool stuff that you've done. Um, and actually, when we were talking the other day, you said about doing an internet search and looking at images too. And mm -hmm. I had done that. And so, uh, you can kind of scroll down and see some of the, the cool stuff that you've done in the past too. Um, there. Yeah. I, you know, there, I, I built a, so a fairly exotic nine string base, uh, for a guy. Um, and I don't see any pictures of that. Um, oh, I, I think it's really, there. I swear I've seen it. Yeah. Well, I could do screen share and probably find it on mine, but, um, yeah. Um, arch tops, acoustics, electric, um, bass, ukulele, the occasional mandolin. I even put together a fiddle for a guy once. That's amazing. That all of those are, all of those instruments that you mentioned, some people spend their lifetime just trying to understand how to build one of those things. Because those are all very different animals. Bending the wood for sides of acoustic guitars is very different. Embracing those is very different than building an electric guitar. Yeah, not only that, but I've, I've made my own uh, bender that doesn't use the same technology as everybody else. So it's, so uh, yeah, it, it's, there's a, there's a streak in me that, is all about invention. I, I wake yeah. up thinking about different ways to do things. Is that, is that the base you're talking about? No, that, <laughs> that one's just as silly, but I think that's actually got 11 strings. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty serious base. I do see there's a couple other that are reminiscent of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The there you go. Yeah. But not as nice. <laughs> well, you know, I have to tell you. I mean, I, there's a couple on here, but the, the best inlay work I've seen is on the, the uh, of this style is on the one that, like, because here, this one would be very similar to what I have. Yeah, except for, right. That, and I think that is a Koa body on that one. I'm so, very fond of Koa. So, yeah. <laughs> Can you get into the gallery and punch up maybe a picture of the green arch top in there? Uh, which one was it? Is that the Terry Adams? Yeah. That was a project I'm really, really proud of. And the inlay in that is pretty interesting. It's great finds. Oh, yeah. Look at that. I just thought that was a gorgeous guitar. Look at that. <laughs> I bet that sounds great. Yeah, it was, it was a player. It was a nice one. Hmm. I wish I had that kind of skill. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think you've got 40 years, <laughs> you well, can go ahead and develop that. Well, you know, and that, and that's that's funny because there's there's a question that Pat when Pat and I were talking before this started that I jokingly said to Pat, uh, but we can ask it as a serious question. 
you know, so we now know that this was built in 1977, mm -hmm. and this was the fourth guitar you made after going out on your own. So this is mm -hmm. the first one that has your name on it. So mm -hmm. it has your has your uh, that's my name, yeah, <laughs> your name on it. When you look at it, is there anything that you're jumping out at you that you're going, hmm? Forty years later, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Um, you know, it's uh, there's sure there's there's been developments and I've learned skills, but in, in, if I had that a uh, commission to do a similar guitar and it came out as nicely as that one, I'd be happy. Yeah. So yeah, there's nothing nothing that really needs. Um, work or improvement or anything. And I mean, I can, I can tell you, and I think Pat can maybe attest to it a little bit. Um, it has, now it doesn't have the pickups in it that you, that you would have put in. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that the pickups I've put in it, which are like the, uh, they're set of PRS McCarty pickups so that, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to be kind of lower output, um, you know, PAF probably kind of pickups in it. Uh, and I can split them. So we changed the tone pot to let me split them. Um, mm -hmm. and, but the guitar sounds great. I mean, it just has a, it has this thing. Like I have several other guitars with PRS pickups in them because they are PRS. <laughs> and, um, it just, there's, there's a, there's a high end to it. There's a, like, I've been using it a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I think almost, almost every week since I've got it, I've used it. That makes that makes me happy just to hear that because I'm a you know the the obvious and maybe the missed connection is it's my respect for musicians that and that that keeps me going. I mean, to to some degree, you know, I I might not have carried on anywhere near, and I probably wouldn't even have started except for you know I'm amazed by people that have musical talent. So that's. It's it's such a gift that I just can't. Uh, I, I'm motivated strongly by that. Yeah, I mean it's it's. I mean, Pat will tell you. I mean he's he's seen it. <laughs> you know, like you know, sometimes we get you know, especially doing the show. There's lots of guitars that have been coming through and that we play and that we like. And you know, I like this one. And go play it for a week or two, and then maybe put it away and play something else for a week or two. I, this one has been in my hands a lot um, for going on a long period of time. So I, I really appreciate it. Really love it. I'm super, you know, excited that you took some time to spend with us and talk about it and um, had your notes. I think that's really cool too. <laughs> that's, yeah. Um, for you to have the history of that guitar now, I just want to add one thing because I know we're, we're wrapping it up, but kind of going along how you, you, know, you say respect for musicians stuff. I can tell you that, when we went to visit his friend Ray, where he got that from, he had the biggest smile on his face. He was holding this, that guitar. I actually took a picture, and before he even took ownership of that guitar, it was his Facebook profile picture. I think it probably <laughs> still is. And yeah, it is. along the yeah, so I mean, he was he he loved that guitar, and when he got it, yeah. he was so happy. And then, you know, he he played it a little bit, and then he he swapped out the pickups. And the first time I heard him play with the pickups, it the whole guitar and the way it rang and the way it played inspired his playing he played some things that were just a little different that morning that were very inspiring i could tell he was really enjoying that instrument and again he's got you can see just some of them behind him he's got a lot to choose from and that guitar comes out a lot um it's it's really an well, amazingly built yeah that's <laughs> the picture right there um yeah that's that's the there picture of Ray's basement that's nice and you know that's i'm a, sure i'm gonna send this interview to ray eventually um but you know, it was not put up there to shame him into <laughs> maybe to remind him I like him, but not shame him into selling it. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> yes, it did. So all right. I mean, any other questions, Pat? My no, I could labor this all day because I mean I'm just I'm just I know. so interested in in Michael and what we've seen from everything he's shown us that he's built and the diversity of what he's built. I want, to, I want to ask a question that maybe will be for round two at some point, but what other things in your life are you into? Because if you approach this this way, I can only imagine other things. I mean, you mentioned, you know, flying airplanes and other things. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm crazy sure they have about, like, 
I am I am absolutely nuts about room remote control airplanes. Um, I I build them like no nobody else builds them, and um, I'm developing styles of building that are, <laughs> that that haven't you know that are not the traditional, and and uh, I'm having a lot of fun with it. I was uh, recently um, was the local chapter's president for four years running, so um, it's it's a serious affliction. <laughs> So do you make the wings out of purple hearts so they don't break when they crash? Or <laughs> <laughs> like much like acoustic guitars, <laughs> airplanes uh, <laughs> function better when they're light. <laughs> right, right. Is there, I, I think one last question I know that we like to ask, is there anything that we missed? You know, is there any question? Is there a question we should have asked that we didn't? Something that's burning and residual over here? No, yeah. not really. No, <laughs> no that the the logo uh, perhaps um, it was just I was being silly one day and I I, I needed uh, uh, I I wanted to put together a logo that was you know maybe not exactly reminiscent but but it was significant to me um, that uh, when I started building um, my guitars and I just, uh, I came up with that. It's uh, based on a Navajo symbol from um, called the Naja. And uh, <laughs> I just kind of went nuts with it, with the eyeball and everything. And I'm, uh, st I still like that logo. <laughs> I still what? build it. People still ask me for those specifically in their guitars. Yeah. What's the na What's the Naja symbol mean? Uh, you know, it's uh, it's been so long since, and like I said, I was kind of just in a silly space. But it's been so long that I, I really couldn't even um, explain it uh, with any kind of accuracy. So I'm not going to try. <laughs> <laughs> I tell my students that sometimes. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Well, I, I, again, thank you so much for yeah. time here. I mean, Can we edit, edit this down to five minutes or so. Oh no, 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 we don't. The videos, the video, we might put, uh, we might put some, well, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Sometimes we'll put like some chapters tags in the YouTube video so people can jump around to the part, you know, the part that they want to see. But no, we feel like we got your time and we want to share that with people, you know. I mean, that's part of this is to share people's time. And so mm -hmm. no, we probably will not edit hardly any of this out. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for um, for letting me, you know, <laughs> visit with you. No, thank you for visiting with us. We really appreciate it. No problem. You want to so, wrap it up? Yeah. So, my, Michael, just to just to show you that we do have gas, I always sign off with our tagline. But uh, on behalf of Jason, we've already thanked you. We really appreciate it. It was very interesting to talk to you. You're a fascinating person. You've built some amazing things. And really happy that you've connected some of the dots for my friend on the instrument he owns now. It just makes it that much more personal to him. So I appreciate your time. But with that... I'm PJ on behalf of The Beard, reminding you no matter what you hear, you never have too much gear. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no cure for gas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's no cure for gas. All right, Michael, thank you so much. Appreciate You're it. welcome. Certainly thank welcome. You. Have a great night. I don't see a leave button. <laughs> <laughs> I can just throw you a <laughs>